This is the Dresden Triple Lock and Side Cut Canal. I'm Darren, and this is the Industrial Revolution. This canal was built along with the Ohio and Erie Canal to connect the, the Muskingon River over here to the Ohio and Erie Canal back up there. Uh, side canals off of major canals were fairly common and they were used to connect businesses, they were used to connect to waterways, they were used for all sorts of reasons. Uh, here in Dresden, Ohio, uh, there was actually a specific problem they had to overcome though, which was that the climb was just too high for a single canal. Let's take a look at how they managed it. So the Muskingum River, just up ahead here, was one of the first canalized rivers uh, in the United States. Uh, that means that they installed dams and locks to make this a navigable river. If we look across here to the side cut canal route, uh, we see that they had a set of th three locks. Now anytime you have a climb of more than about 10 feet in these uh, 19th century canals, uh, you have a problem. Uh, over about 10 feet, uh, the locks, well, all the lock gates leak, to be fair. And if you get over about 10 feet deep, uh, a 10 foot rise on the lock, the problem you encounter is that the water coming in from the upper gate starts to pour down and flood the boats in the lock. Uh, that's why canal locks of more than about 10 feet deep were really not favored. They happened, for example, uh, on the Ohio Neary Canal, we have a lock called Deep Lock, which is about 19 feet high. I have a separate video on that one. The more common way to do it, if you needed to, was to put in a chain of locks. Here you see there's three separate locks. There's two ways to do that. The easy way that you'd first think of is the way they did it in Lockport, New York. In Lockport, which I'll be making a separate video about the next time I'm in the area, they had to climb about 60 feet up a cliff face. They did it using two separate flights of five locks each. One flight was dedicated to canal boats going up and the other dedicated to canal boats going down. Unlike in Lockport, here in Dresden, instead of building the locks back to back where the canal boats would go directly from one lock chamber into the next, all the way up the, up the chain, here in Dresden they actually set up these bays in between the locks. Now, you can't climb quite as steep with these bays and the geology won't always support them. However, if you can manage it, if you're able to pull it off, you have one huge advantage with these uh, bays in between the locks, which is that you can actually greatly increase the efficiency of your locks and actually utilize them to 100% efficiency. Because with uh, these extra bays, you can have locks with canal boats up and down both in the same chain of locks and they pass in the empty bays. Here we actually have a good view. We're in the second lock here. And you can see there's a wall here at the bottom. That's a concrete wall, that's not the original, but there would have been a, uh, a sort of triangular shaped wall there at the bottom to hold the lock, the lock gates, not them from going too far. And we have the the bays here, the lock gates would fold smoothly into those originally. And here in the stone, we have the hole where the uh, hinge would have been, the hinge, so to speak. Now, this lock's not in great shape, obviously not in use anymore. Missing a few stones here and there. But still a great example of what a triple lock looked like and, what, and one way to build a compound lock. The water trickling through here is still here today. Things are a little wet out here right now. Uh, but remember, all locks needed a good water supply in order to run. 
Originally, there probably would have had to have been more water in here coming through than this. In fact, here we have a bit of the hinge strap left on the stone here. You can see it right here. Uh, it's not much of it left there, but it is there. We'll take a look on the other side here in a minute. And we walk around. This upper lock looks to be the tallest lock. That's got to be, at a guess, we're, well, I'm probably looking 10 feet from the bottom here, but remember that we're standing in water. There's a pool of water down here in the bottom. So these two little sidewalls, uh, those were probably about water level. So the tops of those probably roughly matched water level. So we're probably looking at about a six foot, six to eight foot rise on each of these locks. Let's go on up to the top and see if there's anything left up there. Stone here is in fairly good shape. It is coming apart a little bit. Again, here we see the uh, remains of the hinge points on here, the brackets that held the, the hinges for the locks. You have the grooves cut into the stone and the pins that secured it. Things have been built up around here, so we no longer actually have exactly what it looked like. But fortunately, the locks themselves have been preserved. Look how deep these are. But you have to remember, uh, the bottom of this lock is probably about where the bottom was originally, is, is my guess. Uh, the other locks are partly filled in, where they don't have those, uh, those uh, banks at the beginning, those, those buffer walls. And you're looking at about a four foot deep uh, water when they're at the bottom. So you've got here uh, probably a 12 to 15 foot drop from where I'm standing. But four feet of that would have been water. Again, you can see these bolts coming up here and the grooves that were cut to hold the hinge pins. Before we go over to the other side, let's take a look in here from the top, since this part of the canal is dry enough to walk in the bottom. So we have these large recesses. Again, the gates would fold into those and they'd fold more or less flush up against the wall. That would help to prevent the canal boats from actually ramming into these. You have the length down here is pretty standard. This is for the Ohio and Erie Canal. Uh, all the locks had to be basically about the same size on any canal. And they were all about the same size for the, uh, when they were built in the uh, early mid 1800s, just because that's what everyone else built. Kind of like today, cars are all about the same width because that's what somebody started building cars. And that's the size the roads were built, so that's the size cars are built today. That's not something new. here again this is off the top lock of the three you can see you have these little buffer walls at the bottom here those are there to prevent the uh, canal boats from actually ramming into the lock itself they're sort of sacrificial in that way and if we look down canal we'll get a little closer here in a minute but you see you've got the same buffer uh, walls on there let's go ahead and head down to the next lock so here's the top of the second of three locks 
Can you see these buffer walls that are on here? Again, those are to prevent the canal boats from actually ramming the lock itself. And the canal gates, the recesses for those. These canal gates, they're actually flush up against the end and I don't know if it was built that way or if the uh, canal gates ended up uh, being recessed a stone or two and the stonework just didn't get fully rebuilt here. Coming down here, remember uh, much of the bottom here is actually uh, filled in. At the lowest point, you would have four feet of water plus the drop of your lock. This lock, probably all of them actually originally went about six, eight, ten feet for all three of these locks originally. Even though right now there's only about an eight to ten foot drop total to the ground here, including the four feet of water that would have needed to be at the bottom. So just imagine where the ground is, that was water. Go ahead and head down to the lower lock now. As we head down there, let's take a look at the only historic photo I could find of this lock from when it was actually in operation. You can see the huge lever arms off the gates used to force the gates open against the water behind them, which remember was about four feet deep, and what appears to be a couple of tow animals over on the far left. And again, here you see the little concrete abutments at the bottom. Uh, the top of those would have been at or a little above water level, so go four feet down from there, maybe five feet down from the top for the actual bottom of the lock. So this one probably went about five, six feet, I'm guessing. Go ahead and walk over to that lock. So overall, with the three locks combined, judging from where these abutments are located, uh, we probably had maybe a 25 foot uh, climb here at a guess. I uh, wasn't able to find any information on it readily, so you know, so 25 feet would definitely be an unpleasant amount of climb for a canal boat at the time. Uh, you would have been pouring a lot of water directly into the canal boat, onto the passengers, onto the cargo, and that's not going to make for a popular canal experience. So again, you try to max out your climbs at about 10 feet or so which gives you enough room off the beginning that the, that the water leaks coming in aren't drowning your passengers. Now you see these are clearly uh, cut stone locks, but in the lock, you see it also looks like it's concrete. And it's not really a concrete lock. They put a concrete skin on the canals later on. They were originally straight stone, and that was through most of the canals built in the early, mid-1800s. Uh, but later on, uh, as that stone eroded away, uh, a lot of canals ended up uh, skinning them like this with cement. So. Typically, you're looking at maybe an inch or two of cement, uh, essentially just covered what had eroded away from the stone. You couldn't add much because you didn't want to narrow the canal down. If you add too much cement, then the canal gets too narrow. The boats were really built typically with only maybe two or three inches on each side of a canal. Come down through the entryway here into the chain. So this one has a little bit more concrete on it still than the others do. But yeah, this one also was originally stone and where you see the long cracks in the concrete up there, uh, that's where the seams in the stone are. So canals like the, the Dresden side cut canal here and it's triple lock allowed you to connect one canal to another canal, canals to rivers, uh, canals into cities, and really ex expanded the reach of the canals uh, throughout the country, throughout the world. Uh, by adding a few locks, you could uh, connect up uh, 
few miles of, of digging canal. And now instead of having a 100 mile canal, you have a 200 mile canal. So it's, it's the perfect setup. And the cost was relatively low and the potential benefit was huge. So places like this are the Industrial Revolution. Hey, wait, before you go, uh, I need your help to keep going here. Uh, so as you can see, I'm, I'm out here today in, in Smoky Mountains, uh, filming on location. Uh, almost every video I do is on location, and unfortunately that's not cheap. Uh, so if you could help me out, uh, I'd really appreciate it. There's, there's some easy ways to do that. First way to help me out is completely free. Uh, just hit like and subscribe, and share this video with your friends. Draw more people to the channel. That, that's great. That helps a lot. Also, you can comment. I love reading the comments. And I've had some great ideas from those comments, in fact. Uh, finally, if you can, uh, if you can help out on Patreon, uh, Industrial Revolution, at patreon.com slash Industrial Revolution, or hit Super Thanks, or uh, something I just added, uh, just before recording this, have a affiliate store set up uh, on the link to the video on the channel or on the closing screen here. Hit the shop button. That'll take you out to my webpage. Uh, follow any of those links out to Amazon or other sites, and the channel will get a percentage of your entire purchase, even if you don't purchase that thing you look at. So lots of cool stuff over there. All of those really help the channel out a lot. Uh, thanks for coming again and watching the video, and I uh, look forward to seeing you again next week.